These women are on fire, and that's how we're going to start our conversation. What does women on fire mean to you? Who wants to start? Amanda, why don't you start? Well, I'll start. Um, so I started my career in 1999. Um, when the statistic now is, you know, somewhere around 10 to 15 percent women. That was true back then too. So, you know, things have not changed a whole lot, although a little. There are a few more women now than there was when I started. But in order to stick it out, you had to have something going inside of you in terms of a fire, a burning uh, desire to stay. Because um, otherwise, you know, you might have felt a little out of place. And I don't so much anymore. Um, and I try to cultivate an environment now uh, where women feel more accepted and welcomed. Um, but, you know, in order to stick it out to get to where I'm at, I had to have something in me that was really kind of tenacious and gritty and, and burning to stay, wanting to stay. Um, but I also think it's just sort of, you know, women that are on fires that are out there. And, um, you know, the more of us that stay and keep doing it, the more that we find ourselves able to help shepherd other women to come in who can also be on fire. Absolutely. Very what do you good. think, Angel? So for me, being a woman on fire is finding that passion for something that takes you to new levels each and every day. And as many of you can probably tell, I was not young my first year on fire. My first year on fire was 38. In a male-dominated industry where they're primarily 20-year-olds. So my rookie year in fire, there were people that were rookies as well that were the same ages as my oldest children. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my experiences living through a catastrophic wildfire in a community in the Met Howe really had a tremendous impact on me and changed my life. And it made me want to make a difference in land management and fire management. And we tend to look at those two things very separately, but they're inextricable. And, you know, I do bring something very different to the table. And I do buck the norm. And that's okay. Yes. Because we need to be challenged to come up with innovative solutions, innovative ideas, and we need to have these conversations because we cannot continue business as usual yeah. with regard to wildfire. Mm -hmm. I yeah. totally agree. And just to bring it home with these two, we were hearing in the last talk about all these fires. We saw these horrific photos, or at least in my mind, they're horrific because it's terrifying to me. These are two women that go out and fight those like for us. So we just appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <Good talk. laughs> so, you know, and you are working in a male-dominated workforce. How did you how did you get into this field? Well, I was getting my undergrad in philosophy at U of O, as you <laughs> said. So that's the natural way anyone gets into fire. <laughs> um, but um, actually, my my father went manufactured firefighting equipment, and that was after his job as a millwright went away, and that was part of you know what happened in you know, the 80s uh, here in Oregon and the 90s um, with the changes in the way in which uh, logging was practices were handled. So he went from being a millwright to manufacturing firefighting equipment. He'd get busy every summer. Then I also had a group of friends who happened to be women who worked on a fire crew. And they kind of went from being just my friends who weren't that much different than me to being emboldened. They had these really awesome boots that they were wearing. Their biceps grew. <laughs> they were confident and they were tough walking around like they knew what's up. And I thought, you know, I want a piece of that. So I went and I knew my dad got busy and made money during the fire season. So I thought, well, that's a good way to keep myself, you know, supported while I go to school and get my ever useful philosophy degree. I went back to school later and, you know, got a master's in natural resources in order to more adequately um, be educated to do the work I do today. Um, but that's, that's really how I got started. Um, I immediately knew once I was out there that fire was both a necessary element on the landscape as well as a real threat to um, our forests and, and communities. And so I always uh, wanted to end up getting into prescribed burning as my real primary objective, but I also knew that I had to figure out how to fight fire before I lit fires. So I spent the first half of my career figuring out how to put them out before I really started focusing on putting fires into the systems that really need them. Yeah. And for me, my journey was very different. I grew up in Colorado in the city, and I had zero idea that 
forests had management. I thought they were just <laughs> wild and did their own thing. Um, and so for me, I was in the military, so I ha I've always been drawn to more of these categorical male-dominated careers. <clears throat> and But I've also been a stay-at-home mom. I've stay-at-home mom, I think, for a total of 11, 12 years. And so I've had both experiences. And when I was looking at reinventing myself after I was going through a divorce, I thought about it and I thought, well, do I just want to go get a paycheck every day? You know, and just, you know, live for Friday? Or do I want to make a difference? And I decided I wanted to make a difference. And so I kind of took my military experience and my private consulting um, experience and took it into a little bit different direction. And I didn't know that natural resource management was essentially forestry when it came to the program at Spokane Community College. And one thing I really appreciate about that program is there is a requirement to have 400 hours of volunteer or paid internship before you can graduate because it is a technical college. And so the degree that you're getting is an applied associates of science. And so you can do anything. You could mow grass at the golf course. You could count, you know, birds, you could, you know, whatever it was that you were drawn to. And I feel very thankful that there were a couple of friends that I had, young men in their early 20s, they did a summer on fire crews, they came back and they said, you need to do this. Hmm. And my response was, um, have you seen me? I'm too old. Like, are you kidding me? And they're like, no, no, you're not. You, I promise you, you're going to fall in love with this, and you need to try it. Um, and so they hounded me for six months. And by the time I finally caved, um, all the job announcements for the federal positions were closed. So I applied for DNR just as like, oh, I'll just throw it out there. And I was offered the position. And... You know, and here I am. And now, so one of the things that you were talking about in my intro is I am working my master's, so in fire ecology. And that, that I'm finishing almost in December. Almost done with. Yeah, it's like I knew that was coming up. <laughs> yes, I'm madly writing right now. Um, so that's how I got started. But I literally had no concept of what land management was. And even growing up in Colorado, this was prior to some of the more modern fires um, I grew up in Colorado Springs, and there have been two fires there now that have burned into the city. But as a child, I had no concept of wildfire. Yeah. So um, I, we definitely are entering a new realm, and we need to have a paradigm shift in how we approach it. Right. I think what you said, you know, your thought that forests were, you know, wild, and that's so important for community members to understand that these forests are managed. We need to be intentional about that management. We can be just as intentional about wildland firefighting management and wildlife management, too, while I have the microphone. We can be intentional about all those things, <laughs> and that's really good. It is. <laughs> I love hearing about how you started in your career. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what your job title is now and what that means? Like, what, what do you do? What does your day look like? So I manage the fire program for the Nature Conservancy in Oregon and Washington. Um, we focus our fire program on controlled ecological burning. Um, we do fire response um, on our own properties, but we really primarily focus on reintroducing fire um, where it really needs to be. So my job is a combination of um, an administrative and sort of strategically oriented position where I help the organization decide where to best put its uh, energy and, and efforts. And then I also work out um, in the operational fields uh, conducting controlled burns, so I lead the burns as the burn boss. Burn boss is a pretty cool title, by the way. Great um, title. <laughs> but way better than fire program manager, even though that's cool too. The burn <laughs> boss is, you know, really cool. Um, and so, and so, there in that in that realm is where I. That's where my passion really comes out. That's where I'm in my element. Um, I consider the work of a burn boss is to be equal art and science. The science is really the input, but the art is what happens in the moment um, out on the ground when you're actually conducting a burn. You really have to be in tune with the environment um, to use fire, which once it's on the ground, 
you can control it to a degree, but things can happen that are unexpected. And so we're always whittling down that risk um, as much as possible so that we can be safe and effective and have the kind of outcomes we want to reduce fire hazard to our communities. Um, working into stuff like Chris Dunn's talk on how we can um, put the right treatments in the right place at the right time um, so that we can better manage wildfires. And so there's, a, there's that blend of operational work and strategic work, and um, I feel very fortunate to be in the position I'm in. It's a wonderful job. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, so my day-to-day -day job, it's really difficult to explain, um, but I will do my best. So I am a federal lands forester for the state of Washington, and essentially what that means is that I work in a program where we specifically work on Forest Service land. And this was a program that's part of the Good Neighbor Authority that was authorized under the 2014 Farm Bill. And the program itself did not come with any funding. And so the intent was to allow, right? The intent was to allow <laughs> the Forest Service and BLM and uh, to be able to increase their forest health treatments because they are not able to keep up with the need that's occurring. They don't have the resources, they don't have the money, they just don't have the capacity. And so this partnership was created, and this is a nationwide program, but each state has set it up a little differently. And so uh, in Idaho, for example, people that work under the, the GNA program for the Idaho Department of Lands are primarily uh, compliance they don't get on the ground and do the day-to-day -day work. In Washington, right now, uh, we do. And for those of you who may not be familiar with how the different agencies work, federal agencies such as the Forest Service are typically uh, known as specialists. You specialize in one particular area. And as far as DNR is concerned and uh, some other state agencies, we are known as generalists, which you know essentially fits me really well. Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> so I get diversity, and I get to experience a lot of new things. And what that looks like when it comes to implementing restoration activities on the forest is that we are able to look at this from an A to Z approach. We, we do the planning, we do the implementation, and then we revisit, and we set the forest up to be able to manage this and not put an extra burden on them. And so it's definitely, I've been in this position since January, and I love it because it kind of marries the two agencies together because as we all know, every uh, government agency has bureaucracy. And so for me to be able to be an employee of DNR and work on Forest Service land is, pretty much a dream come true. And so my day-to-day -day work, a couple days ago, I was hiking up a mountain in the snow, um, looking at the aftermath of a record snowstorm that we had a few weeks ago that took out a significant amount of western larch. Uh, they just snapped off. Mm -hmm. And this was in an untreated area, but I also saw it in treated areas. It was just a fluke snowstorm. Mm -hmm. And so hiking around, and I was taking very good notes on where the elk tracks were, um, it's gonna come I was back putting pens those. in my Onyx. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a day-to-day -day for me. I might be out doing reconnaissance so I can determine how we're going to approach uh, the timber sale that we need to do. Or I might be out marking the boundary um, for the timber sale or out marking the trees that we want to keep on the landscape. And then we do work with the Forest Service. We're implementing their projects. It's their land. So we work with them quite regularly. <clears throat> and we also partner with... Um, environmental groups as well that have voices and want to be able to have their concerns be heard and addressed. And for those who may not understand, if we have a program that has no money, then how do I get paid? So essentially, as this program gets off the ground, we have to sell trees. I mean, that's the bottom line. And we need to sell them. That's part of the restoration. Do we need to sell them on every piece of ground? No, but we do need to be able to build up a bank account so that we can start looking at other restoration activities. Because in eastern Washington, we have a lot of insect and disease going on sure. and a lot of overcrowding, overstocking. So for me to have the ability 
to build on these relationships mm -hmm. with the different stakeholders and have these conversations uh, and be able to come to some common ground at the table and collaborate together, I think we're, we're eliminating those jurisdictional boundaries, those invisible fences. You know, that patchwork you see on the landscape when you look at a map of green and pink and white, and it's gone because we're sharing the stewardship yep, together. together. We're yeah. working together. And so, yes, I get to be in the woods almost every day, and sometimes oh, I'm freezing and great. soaked, and other times I'm sweating, and, you know, but I also appreciate the people aspect because that is extremely important. And I do still stay involved in fire too. So. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I wish that I was out in the woods every day still, but <laughs> not every day. I still get out there some, which is really nice. This, yeah. you know, this great audience we have here today, they've given up a Sunday to come right. talk about wildfire, which I think is just commendable. And I'm glad everybody's here. What is something that, that they might not know about wildfire that you would like everybody to know about wildfire? I think for me, the one thing that I would really love for people to understand is, you know, it's a tremendous blessing that our country is growing and that we are having more and more people come into our communities. Um, but that does also create this urban sprawl into the wildland urban interface. And I think oftentimes what we fail to realize is that we're pushing our housing developments out into these fire prone and fire dependent areas. And guess what we've just added by adding all those houses? We've added fuel. Fuel, yeah, right. So if you look at, um, you can Google this yourself. I'm not making this up, I promise. If you look at the Tubbs <laughs> fire in uh, California in 20, October of 2017, it took out over 5,500 structures and killed over 120 people. Oh my goodness. It was an urban conflagration is what they called it. it. The fire literally moved from house to house. In contrast, if you look at the Hanley fire from the 1960s, it's almost in the exact same footprint. And only 105 houses were lost and no lives. So what was the difference between those two fires? There was over a 2,400% increase in homes yeah. added to that area in that time frame. And I think that's the biggest thing that we need to realize is if we are expanding into nature, we can't just stick our heads in the sand and expect that we can stop fire, because we can't. Right. But Which, we can manage it, and we can, man it, we can be resilient, we can learn to live with it, and we can adapt. And that's what, what these conversations, I hope, bring attention to, mm -hmm. is that we have a need to think outside the box and come up with new ideas. Yeah, what would you add to that, Amanda? I think that it's important to remember that the hundred some odd years during which we've been quote unquote successful with suppression is um, a blip on the screen in the time frame during which humans have lived with fire. Um, indigenous peoples used fire as a tool to manage the landscapes that they lived upon. They lived with these so-called natural fires, lightning ignited fires. Um, and didn't have the issues that we do today. So we do have people to look to for an example that's already been set about how to live with fire. Um, it's inevitable, it's not going away, and the better that we can adapt to the inevitability of fire to learn how to prepare for it coming and knowing it's gonna come. Um, doubling down to keep it out of these systems is going to make the problem worse. It's part of why it's worse today, because we have been so successful. Um, we haven't just been successful because of the human power behind the uh, fire suppression efforts. A lot of it's because of uh, fluctuations in climate. Um, some of which are longer term and some of which are shorter term. But um, you know, we're in an era now where we've got compounding dynamics um, all at play. And ultimately, it's a combination of learning that fire is inevitable, we have to live with it, as well as bringing in people from all walks of life to help address the problem, whether that's women on fire, as we are here, or, or other people who are historically underrepresented as stakeholders uh, in, in, in the efforts to figure out what to do. And, and so I think that you know, if we look to the past, knowing that that's a way to the future, but we also recognize that the future is uncertain and a lot 
different than in, in what we know of as the past. Um, and just really uh, acknowledging that this is a diverse and complex problem and we need all the different perspectives and people that we can find to, to adequately address it and move forward in the future. So let's see how I want to ask this. It's, you're talking about it a little bit with you know, we are moving into these landscapes where, where fire is becoming, you know, even my neighbors are asking me about wildfire now and they never have, which is an opening to talk about forest management. Um, what, what other, you know, more than, more than just bringing people to the table, which I think is hugely important, we absolutely need to have all these voices talking about how we're gonna manage um, for wildfire, but what, what other changes are needed, do you think, um, in managing these landscapes? Well, I think there's a tendency to see things kind of black and white or to be very simplified in thinking about what active forest management means, for example. Um, to me, it means a whole suite of treatments. And so we need to be open-minded about different approaches and different fuel types, um, you know, where in one place you can do lo a logging treatment and that will do a lot of the work for you. In other areas, that's not gonna work and you're gonna need to apply fire. Or you're gonna use some other kind of surrogate for fire. Um, there's places where we really can't burn. It's just not feasible. And so we have to figure out another tool. And so being open-minded and adaptive to a lot of different strategies is really important. I think that people who live in these places that Angel's t Angel is talking about um, need to recognize that a lot of the work needs to be done by them on their homes. The Paradise Fire, for example, there's plenty of photos that I've seen from that fire where the trees are green right next to a house that burned down and it's because there was a bunch of pine needles collected in the gutter and on the roof. That's a pretty simple fix. So a lot of the solutions are not that complicated. Even though the problem's really complicated, a lot of the solutions are very simple. But it's taking initiative, taking responsibility, and everybody coming together and not just expecting that someone's going to save you. You know, these firefighters out here are putting themselves in harm's way to save yeah. people's homes. And those are homes that oftentimes the, the owners have not really done their part to take care of so that when that firefighter arrives, they have a chance of success. So we're talking about workplace safety here too, mm -hmm. not just community safety, but where are people working and what is it like for them and what kind of risks are they taking on? And how, how simple of a fix is it to clean your gutters that can help that firefighter when they come to try to take care of your home? How simple is it to rake around your house? I mean, so many of these solutions are, are simple on their own, but when you add them all up, they create a really complex problem. And so it's, it's hard to go, oh, this is an immense, uh, daunting, complex problem, but yet there's all these simple things that we can do. And then biggest thing is not to give up ever and not to lose hope because you know, I burn for a living, basically. I set things on fire for a living. That's my primary job, even though I'm a firefighter. That's what I do, right? And I look at these maps and going, oh my gosh, so many acres that need to be burned. And I'm just picking off little acres here and there. And I'm going, man, we're never gonna get there. But what, if I stop, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna lose hope. So I keep the fire alive, keep it burning, and keep going, no matter what. Even when you think, oh man, this isn't gonna do any good. Hey, I made that difference on that one piece of ground. I took care of that one nice stand of trees. And now when the wildfire rolls it through, even if that's the only stand that survives, by golly, that matters. So I think that's what I would say in mm -hmm. answer to your question. I could go on about that, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your passion for yeah. it. Angel, is there anything you want to add to so that? I, I definitely uh, second what Amanda has said. And I think what I would like to add, and this is just what I've seen in Eastern Washington, is many people are looking to get out of the rat race and find some solace and some peace. And so they're tending to move to the wildland urban interface and they buy land in five, tw 10, 20 acres. But maybe they lived in a city their whole life, you know, like I did. And now they have no idea what to do with their trees. And mm -hmm. there are programs available, oh, yeah. um, but a lot of times learning how to tap into those can be challenging when you don't have any connection to those agencies. And I'm really encouraged to see our federal and state and local uh, fire district agencies partnering together to have more of a shared stewardship approach and an all hands, all lands. Uh, philosophy 
And I would really like to see that continue on down. Um, I don't normally say I'm in favor of a top-down approach to management, but in this case, I really feel like it's very applicable because I would like to see it trickle down to these five, 10, 20 acre parcels and these landowners uh, partner together and learn how to make their community more adapted and more resilient. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can all relate to this to some degree. What I have run into the most is most of these people don't even know their neighbors at all. They don't right. know their names. Right. They don't ever talk to them. They don't have any interactions with them. And you know, we have this idea that we want to buy some property and it's our private land and you can't tell us what to do. And this is Eastern Washington. Like, don't come over here and tell me what to do. <laughs> this is my land. <clears throat> some of those tendencies in Oregon is too. Okay. <laughs> it's probably universal. And you know, and I respect that. Absolutely. You know, that, that's part of living in America. However, at the same time, it's a real issue. Um, if you have a lot of ladder fuels, you know, your property's overgrown and you have vegetation from ground to ceiling and your neighbor's doing everything they can, it doesn't matter. Right. You know, if, if you're creating a, the perfect conditions for a crown fire or, you know, a fire that's going to overtake their home, then you're kind of contributing to the issue. And so for me, I would just like to see more community engagement and more yeah. community partnership yeah. to look at the landscape level. And some of you may know this, but in the Midwest, there are farmers that actually collaborate together and do prescribed burning. Mm -hmm. And one farmer, farmer will light his land, follow it through his property to the, the boundary, and the next farmer will take over that burn and follow it through his property. They manage together, they coordinate together, and granted, we don't have farmland, you know, directly next to us, but the idea is that they're working together. I love that idea. So everyone took that note down. If you live next to Forest Park or if you're right in the, like, take a look at your gutters. Maybe put that on your list for next weekend to give your gutters a good clean. Check to see that you've got fire safe space around your house, right? That's one thing we can all mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you both are such an inspiration to me. You are, you know, you're working moms. You are balancing your career with your uh, family life, which I think a lot of people in this room, maybe everybody in this room can relate to balance and how hard that is. Where, where do you get your support? Where do you get your inspiration for doing all that you're doing? Well, I, I have a supportive family to begin with. That helps. Um, you know, it, it's really helpful when um, your partner, your husband in my case, is, um, is equally invested and involved in um, raising our son. That's where my son is right now. I brought him up here to show him off for a second, but I figured he'd be a little distracting during our conversation. So <laughs> I almost did it, though. Just we did talk about it. Did. Yeah. Um, so of course, just that direct family involvement. Um, I think that my community, which I have built around the idea of support and exchange. Um, you know, I haven't mentioned this yet, but a lot of the work I do is in support of the training exchange program, um, which is uh, helping to train firefighters to do um, good practices with prescribed fire. And so, um, you know, I, I build community through that kind of work too. So there's friends that I've, that I've made who've helped me, um, you know, sort of become uh, a better mom in my professional life equally. Um, I would also say my employer is very supportive and, and uh, allows me a fair amount of flexibility. And so I have a lot to thank the Nature Conservancy for when it comes no, to being able to, to balance my professional life and my personal life. Um, but I'm not going to say it's easy, I, but I'm new to this. So I, you know, I spent the first 40 plus years of my life on my career. Um, and I didn't, I, I had a child very late in life. We have uh, sort of opposite, um, you know, paths to that extent. And I think there's something to be said for that. It's very difficult for women to balance both um, because of our roles as primary caregivers in families. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I feel very blessed that I've been able to actually pull off both. Um, my first baby is definitely prescribed fire, um, but, you know, <laughs> don't tell Hans that. We won't tell that. Hans that. Don't yeah. tell <laughs> um, But, you know, I, now, now that I have a child in my life, you know, it's, there's, it's like, 
it's, it's a tall order, but I'm making it work. Although I will say that I kind of welcomed all this early rain this year. I'm sure a lot of you did too, because it put a lot of fires out, but I was getting ready to go out and burn. I was trying to figure out how to do that, and, and I, I didn't get to test my sort of strategy on that, but I will later. Um, do they make those special fire clothes for infants? Oh, do they, I would like to think so. Like, I don't know. <laughs> That'd be so cool. Out there. I know. Front no pack onesie. onesie. We need a no mix onesie. <laughs> I mean, I did get a couple of really cool fire onesies for Hans. Oh um, my God. Yeah, so nice. one with a drip torch on it. For those of you who don't know, drip torch is one of the tools we use. It's a, a canister of a mix of diesel and gasoline that has a tube that comes out of it, and there's a little wick on the end, and we drip. Uh, fuel that catches fire on that wick, and that's the primary tool we use. That's for what Smoky Bear like, was holding in that Smokey photo. Smoky Bear was the, holding a drip yeah. torch. I'm sure yeah. plenty of you know what that is, but yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, my support system, so it's kind of a little unusual in that, yes, I live in eastern Washington, but I don't have any family up here. I moved away from Colorado, came up with the military, and stayed because I fell in love with the area. And so I do have support of my family. They're just long distance. But what I do have that's local is I have, first of all, my adult children who have encouraged me every step of this educational journey and have told me not to give up no matter what. And I've also had the support and encouragement of friends that I, uh, that I have outside of this new path in my life. Um, and I also have friends that I've made inside this new path, firefighters, foresters, educators, professionals. And I feel tremendously, tremendously blessed to have built that network and have that support. And so those are the things that really encourage me along the way because, yeah, it's not easy, mm -hmm. you know? And, and yes, we are the primary caregivers, so it is very difficult to juggle everything. And do I juggle everything? Well, no, you know, I don't. But I never give up, and I give it my best every single day. And I think the thing that I would like to highlight too is yes, we're women on fire and we have to juggle these things, but the men do too. Mm -hmm. And they may not be the primary caregiver, but if you ask any male firefighter who's a career firefighter, if it's a job or a lifestyle, they will tell you it's a lifestyle. I believe yeah. it. Many of them have given up relationships, giving up the idea of having kids, settling down. Fire is their life, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that we need to recognize that people are making these sacrifices in their own personal lives for the greater good. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... Well, they're heroes. Right. right. It's Firefighters are heroes. <laughs> it, it's definitely the epitome of service before self. Yeah. And, you know, whether it's men or women. And that's something that I think that none of us really think about. Mm -hmm. And we think about it when we think of our military members but we don't necessarily think about it with our firefighters or our first responders in general. It's very difficult. And so for, for me, I think that's one thing that I am very grateful for is to have that support system. And Excellent. I don't take it for granted. No, no, I'm glad you don't. That's a really good answer, honest answer. Um, in, in your professional world, what are some of the, what, you know, what is the biggest challenge that you're facing in, in your work life? In terms of for work. me, uh, my biggest challenge is I'm young in my career, but I'm definitely long in my experience, um, not related to forestry. And I think the biggest challenge for me is navigating through a traditional system that's set up to work from the ground up mm -hmm. and find my way in there. And I guess lucky for me that I don't really pay attention too much to all of that, and I just kind of keep doing my own thing. And I take every opportunity that I have that comes my way. I never say no to opportunity. Um, but I definitely have found it a little rocky of a journey um, to figure out what my place is. And, you know, I figure all the experiences will culminate and to be something that will make an effect on our lands and our communities. And that's all I want to do is just make a difference. Yeah. Um, so I spent the first 14 years or so of my career working for the US Forest Service. 
And that afforded me the opportunity to go out and do a lot of work on wildfires. Um, I got a ton of training, and I was really kind of in a more of a seat of power in a lot of ways because, you know, as we all know, the federal land management agencies, um, you know, are in charge of stewarding pretty large pieces of ground. A huge percentage of Oregon's forested landscapes are managed by the Forest Service, and um, I wouldn't be where I'm at today without that without that experience of working for them and the support I had then. Um, when I left, it was uh, kind of on on a risk of um, you know not getting back in and maybe not having as much of that power and influence over um, management of public lands, which I still am very passionate about. Um, so I think I'm a little bit challenged at times because I'm now on the outside of that, but I'm still trying to help influence the work that the Forest Service is doing. Mm -hmm. um, primarily, I do that through um, these prescribed fire training exchanges um, that I'm a part of, as well as the Fire Learning Network, which is um, a, it's actually partially sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service as well as the Department of the Interior agencies that partner with uh, Nature Conservancy. And we have some flexibility in doing things that the federal government doesn't do. So we, we come together really well. So it's not a huge loss of power, but, um, you know, there's times when we just can't quite, we don't have quite the same influence, mm -hmm. um, but we trade that for flexibility and adaptiveness and, you know, we can, we have quick turnarounds on a lot of things that we do relative um, to our federal partners. So I would just say mostly it's getting out of the wildfire game, which I, you know, rarely am on wildfires anymore and that's only been in the last uh, four and a half years since I left the Forest Service that I've been experiencing that. Um, you know, like I've said, my objective has always been to work in prescribed fire primarily, and I do a lot of that, but I, uh, I do miss the wildfire game a bit, and sometimes I'd like to get back in on that a little more. Um, you know, other than that, it's just, um, you know, kind of like I was saying before, not giving up hope and not letting that feeling of fighting a losing battle get you down, because um, that's easy to do. It's easy to give up hope. And um, so just any time you're like, oh, man, these problems are so immense. How are we ever going to overcome them? What's climate change going to mean for my son and, and grandchildren if that happens? Um, you know, it's all too easy to succumb to those um, fears. So to really make sure that you don't let that happen and keep hope alive and, and just keep doing the good work you're doing is, I'd say, is a big way that I um, face those challenges. I think that's awesome. Do you think given the, those scary words like you know, the, not giving up hope and these big catastrophic wildfires and climate change and forest management and prescribed burning really being one of the answers to these yeah. problems, do you think we're gaining any social acceptance to forest management and prescribed burning? Yeah, I think so. Um, I find that I don't have to explain it as, a, as extensively as I used to. I, I remember times when telling that story and telling people about what we were doing with prescribed fire took a lot more time. And you know, I think um, folks are more familiar with those terms now. Um, it's part of the reason I get up in front of groups like this. Um, and I take those opportunities like you were talking about to talk about this. Because if we don't do that, then folks are don't, they don't know. And all they see are the air tankers flying on the evening news. And if that's all you see, and that's what you think fire man management is all about, then it's, you know, there's a failure somewhere of the story being told of what the alternative is. You know, I like to say that prescribed fires should be boring. They should be something that you don't, that are not exciting because they have become a part of the system. You've, you've reintroduced fire enough that it's playing its natural role and things are not that exciting. Um, you know, it's, it's a much safer environment to work in. Um, you know, if you look at the, the costs, whether it's financial, um, in public safety or human health, um, those working the fires or those, you know, living in the communities around them that may be affected by the smoke, there's no comparing. It's orders of magnitude difference in terms of the impacts. And if you don't tell that story, then people think, of the only thing they think about controlled burns is the one that got out of control that made the evening news <laughs> where the air tankers were flying, just like any other wildfire. But how often do the stories of successful controlled burns make the news? Not as often, but it's getting better. Um, you know, I'm always following this stuff um, in the media, whether it's social media or, or the news, and I'm, I'm seeing so many more stories, a lot of them inspired by our indigenous peoples in this country, particularly folks in the Northern California region, the Iraq and the, the 
Klamath and the Yurok, uh, the Karuk tribes are, um, they're taking this on in a big way, but so are tribes in Oregon. The Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs do tons of burning. They do aerial ignitions, but people don't usually hear about that, right? So, you know, telling the story is super important, and, and I think that the more it's told, the more people understand and that they see the difference and that there's a way to um, not prevent wildfires, but mitigate their impacts and make the environment safer for wildfires, for, for firefighters to work in through the implementation of controlled burning. Yeah, that's an awesome answer. That's what I want. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Do you have anything you want to add to that, Angela? I just wanted to add that another element of the controlled burning that people are definitely starting to understand, especially on the west side of Washington, in Oregon after the last couple summers of smoke, excluding this summer, is that when you're, con when you're doing a prescribed fire, you do it under a set set of conditions. You have run modeling, you have looked at science, you have looked at best management practices, and you have tried to minimize the impact of smoke to um, high-risk communities uh, just downwind. So you try and use favorable weather conditions to achieve those objectives so that if and when, it will be a when, wildfire comes through, either it's going to drop the fire behavior so drastically that it will help stop the fire, or it will have minimal fire behavior and the smoke impacts to the communities at that point will be significantly less. And I think that's a big message that we all can take benefit from. And particularly for me, um, I have asthma. And I'm a firefighter. <laughs> and so I know what it's like to be affected by the smoke. And every summer, at the end of the summer, um, I have to take a little bit of time and kind of recover. Yeah. So I know what it feels like to be impacted by smoke. And so that's why I'm such a huge advocate for doing this under controlled conditions. Mm -hmm. And the added benefit to that as well for firefighters is it makes us better firefighters. Because yeah. now we have experienced fire behavior without trying to put it out. And we can determine some tactics that we can use when we are suppressing the fires. So ultimately, it's going to make us much better firefighters and impact the ability for us to be able to control those wildfires like Chris was talking about. Well, that's such an important message. And I hope you got to know us a little better through this conversation and learn a little something about prescribed burning and women on fire that you didn't know before. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.